What I'd like to cover at this point is going to be allergic reactions. Unfortunately, uh, uh, John and I have been working for a couple of days, and so this is going to be somewhat brief. So you might have to explore this later elsewhere. Uh, we've, John and I have also talked about me doing some kind of audio to complement this, but at least I want to give some ideas uh, about allergic reactions, including asthma. And the reason for it is they're extremely common. I don't, I don't know if I've ever worked in any kind of first aid area where people don't come with me with the with a typical allergies and also uh, asthma or exacerbations of asthma, meaning difficulty breathing. So I want to discuss it. I'm not going to go into the physiology or pathophysiology, but I do want to say that I would, I would suggest understanding it because knowing how allergies are formed and the whole histamine-induced responses to, in both this kind of allergic asthma and allergies like uh, hay fever, uh, some food allergies, is really helpful because understanding the pathology behind it is really helpful. I want to say that if you go on YouTube, there's a bunch of videos actually that have really good animations uh, showing the responses to this. Usually they're made by drug companies, but in your mind you could just substitute some of the herbs I'm talking about for the drugs that are used uh, in these animations. So talking about allergies and asthma, I want to be, I'm going to clarify it with which might be a kind of a unclarifying term. What I am talking about are type 1 hypersensitivity reactions. I'll say that again. You can say it with me. Type 1 hypersensitivity reactions. They're the most common form of allergy. There's four main kinds of allergies. And this is by far the most common form of allergy. They're also known as immediate allergies, meaning that you come into contact with something, and that something is called the allergen. You come into contact with an allergen, and you pretty much have an immediate response. And it's just type 1 because there's four types. And hypersensitivity is because what allergies are, including asthma, allergic asthma, there's a couple kinds of asthma. I'm only focusing here on allergic asthma is because uh, these reactions are overreactions in your body. When I talked about bee stings, I mentioned briefly, and it's only going to be briefly here too, I mentioned what's called anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis is also a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction taken to the extreme. What all of these things are is your body is reacting very strongly, not just your body, your immune system, is reacting very strongly to usually what are very harmless substances. Pollen, animal dander, uh, dust. These things that are not, for some people, don't respond to. These people, their immune response creates the symptoms. So with your body's white blood cells, not all of them, but a certain set of them, create all the reactions you have with allergic asthma and just allergies like pollenosis, like hay fever. So th that's why it's called a hypersensitivity reaction. It's considered an immune problem because it's an upping of your immune system creating this disruption. I want to separate allergens from toxins. So a toxin, I think I've mentioned this elsewhere, but quickly, a toxin or a venom like a bee sting, that affects everybody. People might have allergic reactions to bee stings, but pretty much everybody has at least a little reaction to a toxin, or let's say, a, uh, a venomous snake, everybody is going to react. That is a toxin. Or chlorine. If every, we all drink chlorine, everybody reacts negatively to drinking chlorine. Uh, allergen is only if you have a reaction to the substance. So poison ivy, which is a type 4 allergic reaction, uh, it's an allergen, not a toxin, because many people have no reaction, so it's not toxic. But for some certain set of people, they have a reaction. So the point here is that these allergens are not toxins. If you react to ragweed pollen, it's not because ragweed pollen is toxin. It's your body has an overreaction immunologically. So there's a lot of ways to treat it, by the way, in the medical world is getting more. I would say the medical world is looking at it uh, in brighter lights, in better ways. And so there's some treatments. There's also a lot of drugs out there that are helpful at times. These type of reactions are hypersensitivity reactions. They are a sensitized reaction. The first time you got stung by a bee, you didn't have all this extra reaction. The first time you breathed in that pollen, 
you didn't have all this reaction. It's the next time and the time after that because it's a sensitization process. Your body is sensitizing to it. And some, some therapies that have been used recently are desensitizing by administering very small amounts of these substances, including in the medical world. Uh, other people have done it with like bee therapies for many years as well. So that's what we're talking about, type 1 hypersensitivity reactions. You might know them as terms such as seasonal allergies, hay fever, hives, uh, food allergies, uh, and allergic responses to bee and wasps things. So again, seasonal allergies, hay fever, uh, asthma, uh, only allergic asthma. Asthma can also be caused, it can have a chronic asthmatic condition. That's not what I'm talking about. Hives, which we'll talk a little bit about. Food allergies, not all food allergies, specific food allergies, and wasp and bee stings. So wasp and bee stings and those hymenoptera, they have a venom, but if it goes beyond local, that means you have an allergic response to it. So in the realm of allergies, the most common uh, symptoms that people have, one of them is called allergic conjunctivitis, and we can call it really itchy eyes. Right, burning itchy eyes. The conjunctiva reacts. That part where I talked about conjunctivitis when I talked about eye cups. So basically your eyes itch. Uh, general itchiness in your body. These are mostly due, by the way, to the reaction of histamines that get released. There's actually a bunch of chemicals that get released, but histamine is a native chemical in our body that's actually used to prevent infections or it's just a kind of a blockade mechanism, histamine. That's why you have the itchiness and some swollenness. Uh, in this case, though, histamine is getting released without any really good need here. But histamine, that's why antihistamines are going to be uh, one of the mainstays here, because it's the histamine creating a lot of it. And histamine is one of the chemicals that certain cells release in response to getting irritated, just to anthropomorphize your cells. So itchiness, runny nose, usually gobs of mucus. But trying to differentiate, I'll say it now, trying to differentiate an allergy and from a virus, from a respiratory virus, one way is not a perfect way, but respiratory vi viruses, colds and flus, could have clear runny mucus, but they also could have green or yellow mucus, just to make it a Christmas colored kind of mucus here. So viruses, uh, your respiratory viruses can have clear mucus, but they can also have thick, heavy, yellow, green mucus. Allergies tend to just have clear uh, mucus because there's no infection. Usually the colored mucus have to do with pus and your immune system getting involved. And usually in, this, of course there's exceptions, but generally in allergies you have clear mucus. So clear runny mucus. So I'm saying it's not a perfect way to define it, but if it, you have really stuffy yellow green mucus, it's a good chance that you have an infection going on, a virus or bacterial. Scratchy throat, very common. Uh, sneezing is common. Coughing is common. Wheel and flare can happen. A wheel and a flare, I mentioned it briefly with bee stings. A wheel and a flare, a wheel and a flare, a wheel and a flare, a wheel and a flare. Uh, the wheel and flare is a raised red area on your body that often has a white spot in the very middle. You can actually, I'm not going to do it here, but you can test for wheel, W-H-E-A-L, and flare responses. Um, and if you get them, like if you scratch yourself and you tend to get red with maybe a white spot in the middle without blood, you might, that shows that you might have certain kinds of allergies. It's, of course, very simplistic, but it's something to do to see how allergic somebody is. Though in general, by the time you're testing yourself to see if you wheel and flare, you already have a pretty good idea that you're an allergic person because you've been having allergies of one kind or another. But that has to do with a subtype of allergies. So wheel and flare, and just rashy in general, uh, though hives rash is the most common kind of rash. So what I've discussed so far are some of the common kinds of allergies, uh, some of the reasons for the allergies, uh, and some of the symptoms of the allergies. When running, you know, itchy eyes, itchy throat, lots of mucus, sneezing, coughing, and, and sometimes just really irritable. Uh, none of these things feel very good. The major risks are more in the asthmatic realm. The major risk for just allergies is just miserableness. There's two stages to allergies. There's an early stage and a late stage. I'm not going to talk much about the late stage, but actually what happens is in the 
early, initially, your allergic responses are histamine induced. Your second group of responses that are often more profound, so in other words, initially you have itchy eyes, runny nose, and then your second is you feel swollen and lethargic and just tired. That second phase, your late phase of allergies, is actually produced by entirely different chemicals. So your body initially responds with histamines, and then your body starts responding with other white blood cells, and they create a, a kind of a stronger effect. The importance there is that antihistamines don't work very well in the late phase of allergies. So that's one problem with allergies is you just feel miserable. Asthma, of course, has much greater problems because now you're going to have difficulty breathing. So when we talk about allergic asthma, that's in a sense more vital to treat because not getting proper oxygen can lead to a whole bunch of problems. With food allergies, uh, some of the most common food allergies, there's a lot of reactions people can have. This is not about gluten intolerance. This is not about celiac disease. This is about your body having a reaction to specific food products and creating like a wave of allergic responses in the realm of the ones I've talked about. Though sometimes right now they're going to be a little more digestive oriented. Some of the common allergens are wheat. It's really the gliadin in the, glu the, gliadin in the gluten in the wheat. But we just say wheat allergies for now. Dairy, uh, peanuts create a lot of allergic responses. But individual people have responses to many individual foods. So these are some foods. Bee venoms, as I've talked about previously, can create allergic responses. Their venom is a venom, but then people have allergic responses, strong reactions to the venom beyond just the venom itself. Anaphylaxis being the worst case scenario, uh, just difficulty breathing and just very itchy all over being not quite as bad, but also miserable making. With a allergic asthma, some of the common things that, uh, that cause aller so allergic asthma, there's many forms of asthma. Let me just quickly describe what asthma is. Asthma is a three-stage problem. All of them have to do with the bronchi, the tubes leading down into your lungs, the tubes leading down into your lungs that actually bring the oxygen in and the carbon dioxide out. So those tubes are called bronchi and bronchioles. Basically, it's a branch that branches smaller and smaller and smaller until there's like 22 separate segments off of the branches. And they go into the deeper parts of your lungs. So your lungs are basically moving the bronchi. The bronchi are partly muscular. And, and so Pedro, my cat, has came here. So if you're watching me divert my eyes, he's trying to get into the camera, I think, except he's the outside of the window. Um, and Pedro the cat, of course, always has to stay out of my, this, we're in your, my classroom, by the way. If you don't know, this is the classroom for the class. And so people, of course, are allergic to cats, actually the saliva on the fur of cats. So Pedro actually never gets much love in the program because if even one person's allergic, he has to stay outside. So that's just using Pedro as an example. So asthma, allergic asthma, uh, has three major parts to it. The most common is bronchoconstriction. So the bronchi, instead of being normally relaxed, the lumen, remember the lumen is the inside of a tube. That's where the air and carbon dioxide pass through. It's where the air passes through. Um, so the first stage of asthma uh, is constriction. So they get tighter. The second stage, they're not really stages. These are different aspects of asthma. Bronchoconstriction is common. Worse asthma is bronchoconstriction. So I'm going to draw this on a board to kind of give a sense of what I mean here. So if this is your bronchioles or bronchi, here's the normal bronchi. This is what you're breathing in. And they're muscular. And then if you have bronchoconstriction, it goes from this to now it's going to be this diameter. So smaller, or maybe I just drew it much smaller like this. So instead of having this much space to pass air, now you have this much space to pass air. Now, if you have inflammation, this is going to get swollen. So if I did it here, it would be easier. So this is your normal right here. Now you have bronchoconstriction, so now you only have this much space. Next, you might have inflammation if your response is strong. And so instead of just constriction, the tissues thicken up. And when the, that's inflammation. When the tissues thicken up, that creates even less space for air to pass through. And then sometimes, commonly, mucus forms in here too. And so what happens is your normally nicely relaxed bronchi are much smaller in diameter. The, the, lumer, the lumen 
are much smaller in diameter. It's just harder to get air in and out. And so what you hear as people try to push the air out, you hear wheezing sounds. And that's due to constriction, inflammation potentially, and mucus. So that's what asthma is. Allergic asthma is those things happen due to allergens, whether it's uh, animal dander or food or uh, pollen. That's what's happening. So the lung, basically, the bronchi gets smaller and it's more difficult to breathe. Some of the things that cause uh, allergic asthma are uh, inhale, this is the technical word, inhaled aeroallergens, stuff in the air, pollen, dust mites, uh, mold spores, whatever is your allergen, breathing those in starts the allergic reaction. So I've jumped, by the way, from allergies. Allergies and asthma, in this case, are both type 1 hypersensitivity responses. I've mentioned quickly about the itchy nose and the runny eyes and the, the symptoms of, of allergies. Now I'm saying allergic asthma. And so with allergic asthma, the things causing it are pollen, animal dander, mold, dust mites, and then people have just lots of specific stuff that causes it to them. The symptoms when this thing happens are difficulty breathing, uh, wheezing, just that sound, that exhalation sound generally, anxiousness, and coughing. You're coughing because your body's trying to force air out. So difficulty breathing, wheezing, anxiousness, and coughing are part of it. Other, by the way, there are other triggers that are less physical or just very different, and I want to name them. Exercise. There's something called exercise-induced asthma. It's not uncommon. With exercise-induced asthma, somebody starts to exercise, just starts running. So they're not running, and they start running, and all of a sudden, asthma. They can't breathe well. There's also cold-induced asthma. Somebody's going from a warm environment to a cold environment, and their lungs react in the same way. All this constriction, all these symptoms. And then for some people, they have stress-induced asthma. You could also have stress-induced allergies. So once again, stress meaning uptight, overly focused, you know, all your energy put into one basket, uh, all those things, anxiety uh, associated with stress. So not only are these inhaled aerial allergens and other things you come into contact with, the way to reduce, by the way, the exercise-induced asthma and the cold-induced asthma is to, if you slowly warm up to exercise, it happens much less. So if you're going to run, you just kind of move your pace up slowly. And with cold, going from warm to cold is wearing a muffler, meaning something over your mouth and nose, and just slowly starting to breathe in air. So in other words, not going from really warm to really cold, which is when it happens more. So I'm going to be talking about treatments right now. So for anaphylaxis, get an EpiPen, or learn how to use the ampules of epinephrine. So I'm not going to cover that here, but it's a very important thing to consider uh, so just get training in how to use that. So what I'm going to be talking about now is allergies and allergic asthma. So there are a couple of ways to, in, uh, to administer them. In this, I'm going to stick to pretty safe remedies. Most of the remedies I'm going to give for allergies and asthma are going to be taken tincture form internally. So basically taking drops of tincture. The one trick is Sometimes people's allergies are so, excuse me, allergic asthma is so bad, they have very difficulty breathing, a lot of difficulty breathing, and if they try to swallow something, it creates a, excuse me, a gag reflex. So I want to say that there are times to use inhalation substances. That's why a lot of the medicines used, um, a lot of things like albuterol inhalers, are inhalers, so you don't have to swallow it, and you get it, and you get quick absorption. Uh, so far, nobody I know has developed any herbs in an inhalation form. Uh, there are some things one can smell to try to reduce asthmatic symptoms, but there's strong plants that I'll cover at a different time. So uh, the point here is, if somebody is having that much difficulty breathing, probably, and you don't want to give them tinctures because they have to swallow it and that can start a reflex unless they can just let it sit in them, probably the best thing to do is to find yourself an inhaler if they don't have one. And I have definitely done that. I've been someplace, somebody comes in, I've tried some medicines, they don't work, and then basically by that point I'm running around saying who has albuterol, who has an inhaler, who has an inhaler. Generally somebody has an inhaler. It's just asthma is common. Then I run back with the inhaler, hopefully they're okay. And so far everybody's been okay. I mean you don't really have a choice. 
I just want to say, so in that scenario, um, the person has to be relaxed as possible. It's difficult. They're having difficulty breathing. But the more anxious they are, the more they're going to be exchanging oxygen and carbon dioxide, oxygen in, carbon dioxide out, and the worse wheezing they are. So you, you do whatever you can to make the person feel comfortable and say, I'm going to run out now and get this. I'll be back as soon as possible. Most likely with something will help you with it. You might then also send people to go to a drugstore or something if you have one handy. I mean, you can, they might need an inhaler. Inhalers can be very uh, important here. I don't carry them on me because they're illegal. So if, if I didn't need a prescription, I might have one to use it in the times that the herbs don't work. If, by the way, if you're a medical, well, you have to watch it. Some medical practitioners can carry them on them, but I, I actually don't know the laws about that, so I'm not going to talk about it. If you know if you're an EMT or paramedic, you, you'll know what your own laws are concerning using inhalers. Uh, most people are just going to be pretty thankful, though, if you give them an inhaler, right? All right. So the main herbs, I've covered one of them, so I don't have to spend a long time on it. So for allergies, not asthma, allergies, my favorite remedy, as I spent a long time discussing, is ragweed tincture. Ragweed is just my favorite antihistamine-like herb. So please look at the Materia Medica, uh, or that we discussed ragweed, ambrosia species, but by far, I find it the most useful to help quell histamine-induced allergies, type 1 hypersensitivity reactions, meaning the, uh, itchy eyes and runny nose and itchy throat and coughing and sneezing and so much just miserableness. The earlier you use it, the better. The earlier you give the ragweed, the better. So I've talked about it. Start with one drop. Make sure it doesn't do harm. Um, and I'm going to ask John a question. John, do you think I covered it pretty thoroughly when I talked about ragweed, or should I cover it more right I now? I think it's pretty thorough. So going with John's recommendation, he's a pretty bright guy, uh, please look at the ragweed. You can click over to the Materia Medica section right now and watch it. So John <laughs> is letting me t know to tell you that on your screen somewhere, I, I don't know where it is over here, maybe Charlene, this... There. This is, where Char this is where Charlene has it. You press on Charlene's lungs, and all of a sudden the ambrosia, that's the genus. So please look at ragweed. My second favorite antihistamine-like herb for allergies is eyebright. It's a really useful one. I actually use eyebright more. Because when I say I would like to, I've mentioned this previously, when I say I'd like to give you ragweed tincture, people just, their allergies get worse. They freak out, they can't believe it, and I'm not always in the mood to describe why. So for any students of herbalism, I'm telling you, use ragweed tincture. Just in case you want to know where I got it from, I got it from Michael Moore, who said a lot of stuff, and I tried a lot of stuff, and this, I tried a lot of stuff of his that worked, in fact, and ragweed has been one of my favorites. So. It's coming from Michael Moore's mouth, now coming from my mouth. I'm suggesting trying ragweed. There, click on it wherever it is and go up there. It's up there somewhere. And then Eyebright is maybe two-thirds as good as ragweed. But nobody is upset by saying Eyebright. You don't have to do all this. Uh, you don't have to do all the explanation. Same thing, though. Try one drop of Eyebright initially. Look at one drop dosage. Try one drop of Eyebright and see if it makes it worse. I'm talking about euphrasia. I use euphrasia officinalis because it's a non-native eyebright that grows up north of here, so I can just gather enough of the eyebright. So it's not endangered in any way because it's weedy, growing in non-native grasses as a non-native eyebright, but beautiful. I mean, non-native doesn't mean very beautiful and not useful. So eyebright is my, si my second favorite. The same thing, large doses. A drop, no problem. Half dropper full, half dropper full, half dropper full until it stops working. Uh, so that's the eye bright. Um, after eye bright, I sometimes use uh, OSHA tincture. And OSHA sometimes works as a little more squirrely than them. Uh, squirrely meaning it just doesn't work as much. So I suggest them trying OSHA tincture. That's usually my main protocols for trying to alleviate allergic responses. By allergic responses, I also mean hives. Hives is a, is, shows up as a rash. Uh, I, I'll put some pictures up of hives, but they're it's very itchy. Hives is often uh, right, often it shows up right over in here. So not in your genitals, but your thighs, this part, this part of your belly, 
Often it goes around the back. It could be anywhere in your body, the hives rash, but very commonly here. It, it tends to show up quick. It's kind of a diffuse, small little red dots rash. It'll often, it's very itchy. It will often go away by itself. The biggest problem with it is that if you scratch too much, you can get a secondary bacterial infection, but it's annoyingly itchy. That's the same thing. That's a histamine-induced allergic reaction. So now I'm going to jump to allergic asthma. And I've already covered that plant too, Lobelia. So you can try ragweed and eyebright, but to just help with the bronchoconstriction, try Lobelia tincture. It's, I've talked about it, so go up over here and then up over here and make a left at the third traffic light and then stop for some tasty Thai food and then come back here and then get some Lobelia tincture. And uh, Lobelia, so just please go to Lobelia. Try one drop initially. The only time not to try it if the person can't swallow and it's really, uh, you, ha you need an inhaler at that point. Uh, otherwise, Lobelia tincture is really my primary. I've also tried OSHA and sometimes I've had success, but I have had a lot more, excuse me, itchy nose here. I've had a lot more success uh, with Lobelia, so it's a primary. And there are other herbs that you can potentially use. Let me look through my list here, but I just want to be clear that with those herbs, I've helped a lot of allergies. They're very common. So we're talking about reducing allergies with antihistamine-like herbs. The two main antihistamine-like herbs in my mind are uh, ragweed, ambrosia, and eyebright euphrasia. There are other herbs, by the way, that are decongestants, uh, such as Biden's, not Joe Biden's. Hey, uh, Joe Biden's a uh, decongestant, congestant. You make a decision about Joe Biden's. But the, the plant called Biden's, or nodding burr marigold, uh, and beggar ticks. So just as far as a decongestant, there's a lot of other herbs. So I'm saying for stopping allergies, the antihistamine-like herbs. But you can also use decongestants, just for, especially for allergic symptoms, just so you breathe better. And Biden's, otherwise known as beggar ticks, the genus is Biden's, by the way, as in Joe Biden's, but it wasn't named from him. Uh, but who knows, maybe a relative. Uh, for allergy, for the congestion that comes with allergies. You know, if the person needs things to help reduce panic, you can use trauma aids. You can use anti-inflammatories. If the person's really congested and anti-inflammatories work, some anti-inflammatories are willow, licorice, turmeric, uh, ginger. And so those are some ones I'm naming, and this list in front of me will also be a list in front of you. If the person's having a lot of difficulty breathing, but it's breathing okay and you just need to help relax them, consider your anxiolytics. Consider your, or your trauma aids, your, the herbs that help reduce anxiety, and anemone is classic among them. So anemone doesn't help bronchoconstriction, but if the person's freaking out, which is reasonable if you have difficulty breathing, try small amounts of plants like California poppy, uh, anemone, valerian, or skullcap, just to reduce it because it'll help them breathe a little bit better as you try to help suss out the best herbs for their breathing. Um, and so there's other medicines that are stronger. It would be covered in maybe a more advanced course. But for now, these are all very helpful uh, medicines that I would suggest. I hope that you get them. So Lobelia for allergic asthma. You can also try uh, ragweed and eyebright, uh, reducing, you know, getting rid of triggers is important in allergies. What's causing it? Can you reduce it? How to tell the difference between an allergy and an infection? But hopefully right now you have at least a sense of, I see an allergy, I'm thinking ragweed, I'm thinking eyebright, I see somebody having difficulty breathing, it's allergically induced, I think I'm going to try some mobilia, I see some hives, I'm thinking uh, ragweed or eyebright again. And there are other herbs, but these herbs are my primaries for them. And hopefully, all of us, as we treat these things, learn more and more plants to treat people. So thank you, and I hope you've learned something uh, about allergic responses. Mm -hmm.